Many companies incur huge costs from which they expect to benefit in the future. For example, companies pay software engineers to make some game or application, and it doesn't feel okay to put all salaries of these engineers in profit or loss as they are incurred, because the company will benefit from these expenditures in the future. So what part of these salaries needs to be expensed and what part can be recognized as an intangible asset? And that's why we have the standard IS38, Intangible Assets, to tell us. I am Sylvia of IFRSbox.com and I help people understand and simplify IFRS. I have created the IFRS kit, my premium course full of videos, Excel files, examples and other useful materials. So check that out at IFRSbox.com if you need to. The standard IS38 has applied in its more or less current form since 2004. But the first rule about intangible assets were adopted back in 70s, so that's not a new topic. The objective of IS38 is to specify the accounting treatment for intangible assets not covered by another standard. So what are these assets to which IS38 does not apply? These are, as I have just said, intangible assets covered by another standard, like assets held for sale under IFRS 5, deferred tax assets, that's IS-12, goodwill, and other. Then IS-38 does not apply to financial assets, expenditures for development and extraction of minerals, oils, natural gas, and other non-regenerative resources, and exploration and evaluation assets under IFRS 6. What is intangible asset? It is an identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance. And identifiable means either separable from the entity or based on a contract or law. Intangibles must be controlled by an entity as a result of past event and future economic benefits are expected to flow from this asset. In order to recognize an intangible asset in the statement of financial position, there are two conditions that must be met. Number one, it is probable that a future economic benefits attributable to the asset will flow to the entity. And number two, the cost of an asset must be reliably measurable. If the asset is acquired separately, I mean purchased or received separately as an asset standing on its own, then its cost consists of purchase price and any directly attributable cost of preparing the asset for its intended use. And sometimes the cost of an asset is its fair value and it's when the asset is acquired in a business combination, for example. When you actually purchase an intangible asset, it's relatively easy, right? But what about intangible assets generated internally? IS38 provides a guidance about several types of internally generated assets. So let's start with development first. It is an application of research findings or other knowledge to a plan or design for the production of new or substantially improved materials, devices, products, processes, systems or services before the start of commercial production or use. So it's simply the design of prototypes, tools, molds, etc. You can capitalize the expenditures for the development stage only when you can prove the commercial and technical feasibility of the project. So IS38 lists six criteria to do so, and you can use very nice mnemonic pirate. Well, I don't know which genius invented it, but it definitely helps. So here we go. P is for probable future economic benefits of the asset under development. I, you have the intention to complete it and to use it or sell it. R, you have adequate and available resources to complete the development and use or sell the product. A, you should be able to use or sell the asset. T, there is a technical feasibility to complete the asset. And E, you should be able to measure expenditures reliably. Another question with regard to internally generated asset is research. And research is defined as original and planned investigation undertaken with the prospect of gaining new scientific or technical knowledge and understanding. And in this phase, you do not develop anything yet, 
but you are just mapping the situation like you do the market research, you evaluate possible alternatives, etc. You cannot capitalize any cost of research into cost of any intangible asset and instead you should expense them in profit or loss as incurred. Then we can have internally generated goodwill. You should never recognize that as an asset that's directly prohibited by the standard. And do not mess it up with the goodwill acquired in a business combination. That's something else. What about other internally generated intangibles like brands, customer lists, publishing titles, mastheads and similar? You cannot capitalize them because these items fail to meet one or more recognition criteria, for example, separability or other. Now, let's explain how to measure the internally generated intangible assets initially. So when you recognize them in your financial statements for the first time, the rule is to measure them at cost. You need to capitalize your own internal cost as your asset and you can capitalize only the cost either directly attributed or allocated on a reasonable and consistent basis. You can capitalize the expenses from the date when the intangible asset meets the recognition criteria for the first time and you cannot capitalize these expenses retrospectively. Let's explain now how to measure intangible assets subsequently after the first or initial recognition. Here we will speak about all intangibles, not just those generated internally. So you have two options. The first option is the cost model. And here you measure the intangibles at cost, less accumulated amortization, not depreciation, but amortization when we speak about intangibles and less any accumulated impairment loss. The second option is revaluation model and here you keep the asset at fair value at the date of revaluation, less subsequent accumulated amortization, less subsequent accumulated impairment loss if any. The application of both models is very similar as with property plan and equipment under IS-16 and amortization is simply equivalent of depreciation. But there is one very important specific aspect of amortization of intangible assets. It is useful life of intangibles because that's quite specific. Intangibles have either finite useful life, it means that you know how many periods you'll use the asset or how many units you'll produce with that asset. The example is software that needs to be updated regularly and that can have short useful life or licenses or quotas issued for some period. And some intangibles have indefinite useful life where there is no foreseeable limit to the period over which the asset will generate some cash flows, for example, brands or trademarks. When it comes to assets with finite useful life, you should assume their residual value to be zero unless there is a buyer or an active market. And you need to revise amortization period, method and useful life of intangibles at the end of each financial year. What about assets with indefinite useful life? You should not amortize these assets at all. And instead, you should revise useful life at the end of each financial year. And if you by some chance assess that the useful life of your asset became finite, well, maybe there's an indicator of impairment and you need to test. How to account for evaluations? Well, it depends on whether the carrying amount of an asset increased or decreased. When the carrying amount increased, then this increase should be credited to equity or under comprehensive income out of the heading revaluation surplus. However, if the same asset has been impaired before and impairment loss was recognized in profit or loss, then increase in carrying amount shall be credited to income to the extent of reversal of such impairments. Decrease in carrying amount shall be debited to expenses in profit or loss, but analogically, if the asset was previously revalued in revaluation surplus, then the decrease in carrying amount shall be debited in equity to the extent of reversing such revaluation surplus. Now, when an intangible asset is realized or used, you need to transfer any revaluation surplus to retain earnings. And the last topic to cover in this short summary for intangibles is their derecognition or removal from the financial statements. 
you should there recognize an intangible asset on disposal that is on sale, on entering into finance lease, by donation, etc. Or the asset shall also be there recognized when no future economic benefits are expected from its use or disposal. When the asset is there recognized, gain or loss may arise. So how do we calculate it? First, we must calculate the net disposal proceeds and it's simply consideration received from disposal less any cost of disposal. And then we shall deduct any carrying amount of intangible asset from net disposal proceeds. And gain or loss from disposal is included in profit or loss. Okay, so that was a short summary of IS38. And if you need to learn more, not only about intangibles, but also about other topics like leases, revenues, consolidation, financial instruments, whatever, then please visit ifrsbox.com, see my articles, videos. I have a podcast show where I respond to your questions. You can subscribe to my free newsletters or to my premium course, the IFRS kit, if you need. Bye bye, and thanks for watching.